equipment. Um, under Chairperson's Business, members, I want to advise the committee that today will be Sam Gardner's last committee meeting, um, as he has been appointed to the Assembly Commission. I want to thank you, Sam, on behalf of the committee, and personally thank you for all of your work and hard work on the committee, and certainly want to wish you every success in your new role. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, well, Madam Chair is the person who's overlapped Sam maybe the longest in this committee. I, would, I concur with that myself. And Kieran, I think I've served with him for quite a long time, and uh, it, obviously it's, it's an elevation to the Commission, which is an important body making very controversial decisions. But certainly, I think we'll miss his wise counsel uh, here on the committee. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Could I thank you and thank the staff for their cooperation? I'm going to miss you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. We, we'll not be far away. Thank you. So, on the 4th of July, I remember we had considered a letter from the Minister um, around his intention to reintroduce prescription charges with the intention of providing access to new, new drugs. Uh, last Friday, the Minister issued a press release uh, restating his position that the new drugs could be funded by reintroducing prescription charges. Um, however, uh, we have a copy, obviously, of the Minister's letter and press statement, and that is on pages 19 and 21 of the table papers here today. I want to also refer members to correspondence from the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry at page 24 of the table papers. Uh, they state that the pharmaceutical price regulation scheme could be used to provide new drugs at a minimal cost at health service. They also say that the exceptionality criteria in the individual funding request processes here is limiting access to drugs. Um, so I'm asking members for consideration of this or views on this. Um, I think that we need to seek clarity, firstly, um, from the minister as to this scheme, which the pharmaceutical company and indeed. The research people at Queen's last week indicated came into function on the 1st of January of this year, uh, and if so, how much has been brought back into the system, uh, and if we get clarity on the amount, if that money can be made available or indeed targeted towards the accessibility uh, of of the drugs that are that are so badly required. I am suggesting that we seek that clarification in the first instance. I Remember? think we have to do so originally because it is quite important that there is clarity there. Okay. Members in agreement, yeah. we do that and we do that yeah, with I the mean, I am totally in support of it, though I know the answer. The answer is that the money that they save is then channeled back into A and E and other services. It's that that's the issue that there's plenty of places to swallow up that extra cash. Uh, but yes, they could physically use it to ring rent a budget for, for cancer drugs. There weren't so many other pressing issues. Well, I think it would be worthwhile again respecting that there are pressing issues, but respecting that there is um, quite a stark inequality here in relation to access to these drugs. And certainly, um, we are being told by organisations like the Pharmaceutical Association that this money can be targeted and should be targeted towards accessibility to drugs. So I think we need to seek that clarification because we are getting too conflicting. Uh, reports did it, and there's an urgency to this. Yep. Thank you. Okay, members. I also just want to raise the issue. Some members today attended the Older Persons Commissioner uh, launch of a call for adult safeguarding legislation, uh, a very powerful uh, report in relation to lobbying for that legislation to be in place. One in which the minister was in attendance. Uh, I'm seeking agreement that this committee right now to the minister, given the fact that there's safeguarding policy uh, being examined uh, as to consideration to legislation to back this uh, important piece of work up. There was also um, a contribution by Professor John Williams from Wales, um, who I spoke to after, um, who's quite an expert looking at the different models in Scotland, Wales and England. Uh, and has offered and is quite willing to come and brief the committee or give evidence to the committee on the models that are elsewhere and potential opportunities um, for the North of Ireland to look at legislation to be put in place to protect um, particularly our elderly population. So I think it would be appropriate that we would look at um, 
as we go forward after recess, looking at convening an evidence session on that. So yeah. I can give the details to the clerk. I know Kieran, you were there too. Yeah, just to, to back up exactly what you're saying, I did have the pleasure of being there this morning, and um, it was a very compelling argument. That I, I mean, I'm surprised that someone hasn't been in Northern Ireland before this in relation to what we're discussing. But nevertheless, it is it's a very important and. Um, the sooner we get to something, the better, and I fully support what you're saying, Chair, on this issue. I mean, there was one one girl, and she um, spoke about an, well more than one incident, and it was horrific, uh, and it, it was carried out by a member of the elderly person's own family. You know, and these are things that that just should not happen, and, and if they do happen, they should be uh, um, caught on, exposed, and dealt with. Very diligently, I would have thought. But I certainly support what you're saying. Thank you, Ian. Mickey? No, it's just one of the things that struck me about it. They mentioned a lot about um, if the same thing happened to children, because child abuse is such an emotive issue, and yet elder abuse is equally as bad, and yet it doesn't have the same profile. Mm -hmm. you know, so, um, I mean, with statistics out a few years ago about the amount of calls to the elder abuse happening. Know, from older people, particularly in some of them in residentials and that, and it's quite st stark, the, the stuff, you know. Okay. So it's, just, it's a very good subject to be dealing with, I think. Okay, thank you. I uh, also want to advise members that the Department has informed the Clerk that there's plans to go to public consultation on proposals for a bill to deal with the secondary uses of patient information. And the Department proposes to launch the consultation on the 30th of June 2014 for a period of 14 weeks. So are members content to invite officials to brief the committee on the proposals um, to our meeting next week? Great. Okay. Also want to advise members that I met with the National Childbirth Trust uh, yesterday. They're keen to deliver services in the north and they met with the master on Monday. I'm suggesting uh, by way of follow up that the committee writes to the department to ask for its views on the possibility of the NCT delivering training to local health service staff and running a pilot project. Members you can understand group. why you'd be keen to deliver, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I can take it that that's agreement to proceed on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, a group called Time to Change are running a project in the Western Trust area on alcohol, and they'd like to discuss the issue of minimum unit pricing with the committee. I'm suggesting that they are invited to the next stakeholders event. Uh, also informing members that we do now have a date for the next stakeholder event uh, scheduled for Wednesday the 8th of October 2014. Are members content? Yeah. Okay. Wednesday of October and what time? Yeah, the morning two, or after? 2 p.m. it will be, yep. Yeah. Okay, members, moving on to item four, which is the draft minutes of the meeting on Wednesday the 18th of June. They're on page 50. Are members content? Great. Item five is a statutory rule, the Pharmaceutical Services Amendment Regulations 2014, referring members to page 56. We did consider and approve the SL1 for this rule at our meeting on the 14th of June. Are members content with the statutory rule? Yep. Um, if so, I'm saying the Committee for Health, Social Services and Public Safety has considered the Pharmaceutical Services Regulations and has no objection to the rule subject to the report of the examiner of statutory rules. Good. Item 6 is our forward work programme. i um, asking members to note that on page 63. Item 7, matters arising. Item 7.1 on page 65 is a response from the Minister about the timetable for the introduction of the Mental Capacity Bill. Uh, the Minister has indicated that officials intend to complete an analysis of the consultation responses by mid-October and brief the Joint Ad Hoc Committee following this with the intention of introducing the Bill by the end of January 2015. The establishment of the Joint Ad Hoc Committee is a matter for the Assembly, obviously, and officials will be working on that over the summer. So are members content to note that in the meantime? Great. Item 7.2 on page 66 is a letter from the Minister informing the Committee of the Westminster Government's intention to carry out a consultation on standardised packaging for tobacco products. <coughs> the consultation responses from people and groups in the North 
will be forwarded to Minister Putz, who will then need to take a decision as to whether the North should be included in any regulations providing for standardised packaging. Are members content to note this for the meantime? Did we do that? Um, just chair, did we? Did the committee um, not at some stage give it support? We did. Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, the that. assembly did. Yeah. Yeah, the assembly yeah. did. And it could also say it would be a ridiculous situation if Northern Ireland went in its own, because that would mean that you'd be surrounded by yeah. other states yeah. who had plain paper packaging, and it wouldn't, frankly, be practical to have us standing out here as having the, the garish sort of advertising logos. So, I mean, this committee's views on this is very clear. Yeah. I, I, how can we, as a committee, purport to support public health and not support this initiative? So, I'm hoping that this is going to come through extremely positively in favour of plain paper packaging. Okay, yes. thank you. Just, just, just on, on that <coughs> issue, to take it further, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was there not a programme uh, come from across the water in England, I think, where there was a suggestion that to ban tobacco altogether? Uh, for anybody born after the year 2000. No, nobody no, would be allowed to take off cigarettes if they are born after the year 2000. Right, well, would we support that? <laughs> I think that would be a bit radical. <laughs> but that's been okay, so the, 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 the view of the committee is, is clear in relation to this and the work that we have done previously, but we are noting uh, this correspondence at this point. Great. Okay, I also want to refer to a response from the Minister on the June monitoring round, which is tabled on a separate sheet. Uh, we had asked the, the minister to prioritise his bids. Um, however, he's restated the position that all bids are of strategic importance to the department, and that if the department receives any money through the June monitoring round, the minister will look again at bids and decide where to spend the money. So, in effect, he's not prepared to tell the committee of his plans until he sees how much he gets from DFP. Yeah, Chair, just, just, I'm disappointed, about, but I suppose he, he, he can do nothing else. But I, I'm a bit concerned about comments made from Mr. Wells earlier on in relation to the June monitoring round. I mean, where the request was for 160 million, and Jim's suggesting that it can be 20 or 30 million. There's a hell of a difference, and you well, know. Well, the reason for that, Chair, is highly unlikely that there ever be 161 million know, pounds in the June monitoring round. So, uh, uh, June monitoring round is always a very small amount because there's not much in the way given up by departments. So that's why I was suggesting we be very lucky to get 10 per cent of it. Well, given that, uh, that scenario, we are going to be in real difficulty. Real, real difficulty. But I do think as well that you know, it's, it's appropriate for every department to have their priority list. Um, and, and I don't accept that the department don't have a list of where the priorities are. And, and, and particularly, and I'll reiterate the point, when we see the fact that something is as vital as the transitional fund for transforming your care uh, was way down the pecking order and was indeed um, labelled as C. So, uh, you know, I do think, and I don't accept that there isn't a priority list. I think there is a list there, and I think that this committee um, are entitled to and should have access to it. Roy? Uh, just about the, the in your monitoring, uh, from memory, last June's in your monitoring, the total sum available was about £80 million. Pounds. So if you're bidding for 160, don't be taking a deep breath. Optimistic, maybe. Okay, are members comfortable that they've stated their their views, thoughts, yeah. opinions on it at this point? Mm -hmm. Okay. Item eight, members, is correspondence. Um, I'm asking members to note 8.1 and 8.2, which is in pages 68 to 70. Uh, item 8.3 on 71 is correspondence from the RCN regarding the report of the pay review body, which was published in March 2014. The pay review body looks at the pay of all health and social care staff paid under Agenda for Change, and it was recommended that there was a 1% increase to staff from the 1st of April 2014. The RCN is asking the minister whether he will implement this 1% pay increase, and I'm suggesting. That we go back to the uh, department to seek uh, clarification on this issue in terms of the implementation of the uh, the, the, the pay raise that was agreed. <coughs> yeah, agreed. Asking members to note 8.4 on 7.3 and item 8.5 on page 94 is correspondence from Mrs. Nillis about services for those living with long-term brain injuries. 
Are members content that we would write to the department about the issues that are raised? Yeah. Yep. Eight six on page one five eight is an invitation from FASA to visit the Nightingale Centre in Belfast and the Eden Village project in Ballywalter. You are more than welcome, Chair, to head down the Irish Peninsula. This is a fantastic, it's a fantastic facility in Ballywalter and it would be well worth a visit. Okay, Very thank good. you. So are members content to visit one of the projects during the next session? Mm-hmm. I think we want to put on our list. I think it's very worthwhile, but let's let's look at yes. what the choices are rather than just pick one because of a letter in. Yeah. Uh, but I think this is an important area. Yeah. And I think uh, as well we will be reflecting as we go into our planning day, just in terms of of of, of visits and uh, external visits. Page um, one five nine, item eight point seven, is correspondence from Fermanagh Fracking Awareness Network. Seeking a meeting with the committee again. I'm asking our members content to invite the group to the stakeholder event. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Page 160, 8.8, is correspondence from Alcoholics Anonymous, again planning to organise an event in Parliament buildings. They haven't decided yet on their format, um, but if required, would uh, members be content to sponsor the event alongside possibly the Justice Committee? Um, again, it de- depends on the format of the event, but I'm just seeking that, yeah, that view at this point. Yeah. Thank you. 8.9 on page 162 is correspondence from AJNI regarding its report, the denial of NHS continuing health care. Uh, among the report's recommendations is one asking the committee to carry out an inquiry into the provision of NHS continuing health care. I am asking our members content to consider this suggestion when the committee considers its forwards work programme for the next session <coughs> following recess. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we're comfortable enough to consider it at that point. Thank you. I'm asking members any note uh, 810 on page 163. Um, item 9 is the evidence session on progress against programme for government delivery plans. Okay, I'm just being told they can't be here to 4 o'clock, so we are going to have to adjourn. I'm off to justice. Okay, sorry, we saw we have a quorum in there. Um, yes, we we'll have a we need four quorum of four to actually take evidence and five if you're making any decisions, you know, to write okay. to or to do anything or Okay. Sorry about the time. We've got, we've got more time to have that last cup of tea with Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, members, um, item 9 is the evidence session on the progress against the programme of the government delivery plans. I am referring members to the briefing paper from the department, which is on page 27 of the tabled papers. Uh, I want to welcome Julie Thompson, Deputy Secretary, Resources and Performance Management Department, uh, Ms Catherine Daly, Deputy Secretary, Healthcare Policy Group, and Mr Sean Holland, Deputy Secretary, the Department, and Dr Liz Rainey, Acting Deputy Chief Medical Officer in the Department. You are very welcome and well familiar with the procedure. So a 10-minute presentation, then we will open it up to you. questions. Thank you, Chair. And, and thank you for the invitation to appear before the Committee to discuss progress against Programme for Government Commitments um, since our last appearance on this issue, which was in September last year. Um, in terms of um, how we will deal with any questions, Catherine will lead on responses to questions about commitments 44, 79 and 80. Uh, Dr Liz Rainey will uh, lead on commitments 22 and 45, and Sean will lead on any questions to do with com- uh, commitment 61. Uh, the Department leads on six commitments, um, each of which has three milestones to be achieved, one per year from 12.13 to 14.15, and those are all set out within the briefing pack provided to the Committee. Um, two relate to the public health agenda and obesity. 
One is focused on long-term chronic conditions, one on safeguarding, improving safeguarding outcomes for children and vulnerable children and adults, and one on improving access to treatments and new services, and one on reforming the delivery of health and social care services to improve the quality of patient care. Uh, in line with the central framework and guidance, the Department has a pro, uh, programme for government delivery plan in place for each of those commitments, the latest versions of which were sent to the Committee in advance of today's session, and we send those to you at the request of the Committee on a quarterly basis so you can see how those are, are moving ahead. Each delivery plan is owned by a senior responsible officer in the Department. They are living documents which can be updated throughout the process. Um, and currently, uh, we have kept in consistent with our milestones and the commitments. The latest OFMDFM approved progress reports are for March 2014, and that is the position that we would want to discuss with the committee today. Uh, the, that position, as reported and approved by OFMDFM, is that four commitments that is 44, 45, 79, and 80 were rated green, i.e., fully on track for delivery, and two commitments, i.e., 22 and 61 were rated green amber, broadly on track for achievement with easily redeemable deviations. The Department remains confident that all the commitments reported as green amber will be back on track and will achieve milestone three by the end of year um, March 2015. The Department continues to monitor the progress of all our commitments and milestones through our own normal business planning, monitoring and reporting processes. There are regular reports to the Departmental Board and to the Minister. Delivery of these commitments and milestones also requires action by a number of our arm's length bodies, most notably the Health and Social Care Board, the Public Health Agency and the Trusts, and we work closely with those bodies to ensure that they are in a position to deliver on programme for government. As you will know, formal progress against the delivery of programme for government commitments is also monitored by a central programme for government team comprising of OFMDF and staff supported by colleagues in DFP supply throughout the programme for government period. I am more than willing to take any questions that the committee may have. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just, I suppose, initially, in terms of the uh, commitment 22, I am not sure who you said was dealing with that. Um, that's, yes, I will deal with okay, that one. Thank you. Um, one of the issues is the investment of the additional £10 million in public health. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yes. Has that been invested? Yes, indeed it has, and in fact it has been um, exceeded the baseline in terms of the PHA budget that we're starting from is 77.2 million back in 2011-2012. So an additional 10 million to that would bring it up to 87.2, and uh, last year and this year it is well over 90 million. So okay. that has been exceeded. So far, the actual figures for 13-14 uh, funding from the department is 92.6 million, and for 14-15, the initial allocation is already 91 um, million, and there is additional money to come. So it has already exceeded the 87.2 that would be the the 10 million additional. Okay. So what percentage of the overall budget goes to public health at the moment? Do we have a Yes, at present um, in terms of the percentage of the PHA spend in terms of the percentage of the total HSC budget um, has risen from one point seventy seven percent back in eleven twelve up to um, for this year one point nine five percent for fourteen fifteen. But to say that will increase. The reason I ask is that one of the issues when the committee were doing work around the health inequalities um, was a recommendation from the World Health Organization at that stage that your spend uh, in relation to particularly prevention, early intervention should be in and around 6% mm -hmm. um, of your overall budget. So I'm just wondering, you know, we don't seem to be in line with that or. Well, the, um, I'm, I'm aware of that uh, report that was done, and yes, the, the figure of 6%, and certainly we would be seeking all the time to increase the percentage of spend that goes to uh, public health and, and prevention. Um, the issue here is, I mean, a percentage depends on what goes into the numerator and what goes into the denominator, and we need to make sure that we're actually comparing like with like. 
Um, in terms of the WHO definition that's used, the OECD definition, that would be the things that would be included in the numerator, in the top figure, would be somewhat wider than what we would include in terms of PHA spend. And then also there's an issue of the denominator as to what's actually included in that, what it is a percentage of, whether it's health spend or health and social care spend. So um, our officials are working to look at the OECD definition and see if we used that and applied it to the spend in Northern Ireland, what the percentage would show so that we can actually be comparing like with like. So we know that in terms of the milestone, we have increased the, the spend by over 10 million now. We've increased the percentage up to just around 2%. But using the different methodology, we would only at that stage be able to compare it directly with the, the WHO figure. Now, that work is being it's complex in terms of what gets included, what doesn't get included, and we want to make sure that we come up with a robust figure that actually compares with the OECD um, figures. And we would hope to have that work completed in the autumn and be able to share that with the committee at that stage. By the autumn, okay, okay. Thank you. The the other issue was in relation to um, the item 80 or reference 80, which was the reconfigure, reform, and modernise the delivery of health and social care services to improve the quality of patient care. And one of the milestones was. Securing a shift from hospital based services to community based services, together with an appropriate shift in the share of funding in line with the recommendations of TYC. So, I'm assuming that funding that we refer to is the, the shift of the 83 million. Yes, that's right. So, can you maybe confirm to us today how much of that 83 million has been shifted? Um, well, well that, that milestone relates to 2014-15, so we don't have an exact measure of that at this point in time. And um, there are a number of actions already in place by the board to um, move towards that shift. Um, we don't have a full quantification of what will be secured by the end of 14-15, because um, as we talked to the committee last week, um, some elements of funding in relation to the transitional funding for TYC um, we're, we're bidding for that in part of the June monitoring process, and potentially that could have an impact on the shift. Um, but, but certainly the target is 83, and that is what um, we're working towards in 14-15. If, if I can maybe answer that, what we will be doing at the close-off of 13-14, we've obviously only just closed off that financial year, and we will be getting figure work on, on how much we've achieved to date. We just don't have it right here but today. Do, do we have any indication at all, given that this, again, and you know, we don't need to rehearse this, is an evolving process, but one that's in, in process for a number of years now, in terms of TYC, how much has been actually shifted? How much was shifted last year, for example? If we don't know 14, 15, do we know 12, 13? Well, we, we, don't, we don't have that figure with us, but the, the board are preparing figures for us in terms of the broad indication of um, uh, the expected movement um, by 14, do you know, I, we, I we can sorry. get sorry, we can get the committee twelve thirteen. We do we do have it, just don't have it here. And we will have um, when we close down the thirteen fourteen processes have that with you as well. But for them we can certainly get you twelve thirteen and that will be no one back. Yeah, I just and I would appreciate that and but I would reiterate as well that you know this in terms of our scrutiny and, and participation in the programme for government delivery is, is a piece of work that we will do that is not something new. So therefore I would assume or suggest that the department should be bringing those figures <coughs> to us, that we, we shouldn't have to go back and, and, and seek them. But I, I would appreciate if, if that figure was shared with us okay. as soon as practically possible. Um, one of one of the other issues um, is in relation to the um, uh, Sean. I think you're dealing with this 61 uh, item 61 or reference 61, the package of measures aimed at improving safeguard outcomes for children and vulnerable adults. Yes. Uh, again, and, and, and some of us attended uh, the event today, and I'm sure you'd be aware of it. The report from the older persons. Commissioner calling for safeguarding legislation for uh, adults. Yes. And I mean, it's suffice to say it was quite stark. Uh, some of the, 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 the stories 
that was being reflected, um, and it was very clear that what was being said from experts was that you know safeguarding legislation isn't going to solve all of our issues, um, but certainly the issues that are happening, particularly to adults who are vulnerable, uh, wouldn't happen uh, around child protection or, or in cases dealing with, with, with children or young people. So I'm aware, because the minister spoke at the event, that there is a current review of, of safeguarding policy. But I suppose what I'm asking you, is there any indication or sense that that policy would be underpinned by legislation? Yeah, we've actually been working closely with the Commissioner for Older People on that issue, and um, we've agreed that in the process of consulting on the uh, new policy, we'll also consult on potential new legislation. So, I mean, it's definitely something that there is a possibility of us pursuing, um, and we'll explore it through a consultation exercise in line with the policy. I would say, though, that just a note of caution. Um, the, 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 there are useful parallels to be drawn between safeguarding children and safeguarding vulnerable adults, but there are also significant differences. Um, uh, I mean, the nature of childhood is, uh, by definition, a, a state where we expect adults to intervene and make decisions for children and to protect them. And while vulnerable adults need protection, we also have to balance that with um, their, their autonomy uh, and their right to make choices, which aren't always the choices that we would make for them. Uh, I'm not sure if that's relevant to the specific point you were making, but it's just a note of caution that, that you can't always draw an exact parallel between children and adult safeguarding. No, and, and I think that they are distinct pieces of work, but nonetheless, I don't think that that gives us, um, I suppose, a profile over one as do the other. Um, and, John, when you're saying that your liaison with the, the, the older persons commissioner, you know, is there a timeline around recommendations for both the policy and or a decision on legislation? Is there any sense of that's the first question in terms of timeline? Second of all, it was very apparent again listening to particularly the expert that was there, um, Professor, I can't remember his, his name now, from Wales, that the models elsewhere um, there has been, I suppose, positives and negatives to them, but there has been clear learning mm -hmm. in terms of some of the models. So, you know, is that expertise? Is the department exploring models elsewhere of how the legislation has been worked up and implemented? Well, firstly, to answer your first question, we're planning to consult on policy in the autumn of this year um, with a view to final policy being published next year. So that will be the timeline when we'll also be considering whether or not legislation is appropriate. Uh, in terms of lessons from elsewhere, yes, very much so. I mean, part of the development of the, of the paper for um, consultation has involved us looking at developments in England, Wales, Scotland, and the Republic of Ireland. Um, there are variations that each of the countries have taken. Some things have clearly worked well. Some things, um, uh, uh, there have been issues arising. Um, uh, one of the common difficulties that uh, certainly colleagues in England, Scotland, Scotland and Wales have referenced to us, uh, and we've, we've, we've experienced some of this difficulty, is uh, inappropriate use of safeguarding procedures for issues that could otherwise be dealt with by existing policies and procedures, um, and as a result, safeguarding mechanisms becoming bogged down by a huge volume of, of, of referrals. So that's one of the things we're particularly looking at, um, because the, one of the worst things that could happen is that the importance of adult safeguarding could become devalued because people think, oh, that's just a bureaucratic process, it's overloaded with inappropriate referrals. So that's one of the things that we're, we're certainly looking to the other countries um, and considering that their experience and how we develop our policy. Yeah, and just finally, I suppose it was very apparent today that particularly the, the case was given of, of the situation in England where it was very considered to be minimalist in terms of the legislation um, and where I think Wales were, were possibly, or Scotland maybe? Well, Scotland would Scotland be seen were, as... Scotland were seen to be ahead of that. So, you know, I do think that there's learning there that hopefully the department are, are taken on board. But one specific issue in relation to the adult safeguarding is the issue of, of again, whistleblowers. So Sorry, whistleblowers yeah. and increasingly the concern that somebody comes forward to do what, what is right and, and, and what we should be supporting in terms of their duty and responsibility. And are quite often the perception is that they are the person who has to jump through the hurdles and, and quite often end up 
feeling more vulnerable than the, the, the story that they're actually taking forward or reporting on. So, you know, what are we doing to protect in, in relation to this programme for government commitment in terms of safeguarding? What are we doing to protect whistleblowers or support? Whistleblowing isn't featuring specifically within this programme for government commitment. Um, uh, but as you'll be aware, because the minister is actually in evidence to this committee, given a very strong commitment to supporting whistleblowers, and has actually issued public statements on more than one occasion, um, encouraging people to be whistleblowers if they feel the need to, to, to do so, and um, uh, or also stating that they will be supported um, and need to be supported both by the department, the HSCB, and employing organisations such as trusts. Um, and Catherine, I don't know from personal perspective no, I, I, if you have anything to that, add to that. No, I, I don't think. It, just to, to reiterate that point, yes, it's something the Minister um, has been very public in his view in terms of uh, the importance of the whole whistleblowing policy and the need to ensure whistleblowers are properly protected. So it is a key, key issue for the Department in working with all the HSC bodies. One, one feature um, that we are taking forward and have taken forward, uh, specifically in relation to safeguard, is training staff to understand what safeguarding is, what vulnerable adults are, and what abuse is, because I think that's one of the, the key things. People need to recognise uh, that a situation is unacceptable, um, to realise that they might want to be a whistleblower. Although, in many instances, and I would say the majority of instances, staff who, when they see something that concerns them, are able to address it without becoming a whistleblower mm -hmm. as such. I mean, whistleblowing is where you feel uh, your organisation isn't taking a concern seriously. We're investigating um, hundreds of uh, sa uh, vulnerable adult safeguarding investigations um, where staff have raised concerns without having to become whistleblowers. Um, we are also dealing with whistleblowing incidents, but the majority of cases we're finding that when staff are given good training, they're reporting things to their colleagues, they're reporting things to their line managers, and organisations are invoking uh, safeguarding vulnerable adult uh, processes. Okay, and, and I don't want to get bogged down in the detail of that, but I would say to you that whilst I accept that, that whistleblowing might not be directly impacting this programme for government target, it was clearly in the room today around developing safeguarding legislation as, yes. as a key issue going forward. And I would also respectfully say to you that the issue of training uh, was, was raised today um, from the Association of Social Workers, in particular, who were saying there are safeguarding procedures that are taking place down a telephone, and, and that that simply wouldn't happen in terms of child protection, but it's happening around adult safeguarding. So I would suggest, Sean, without opening up the, the, the entire debate, um, that, that, that you reflect on that as well, and that this committee, as the policy evolves and the thinking around legislation evolves, that this committee are kept informed of that. Of course, as we go to consultation, as uh, would always be the case, we'll be engaging with the committee um, at that stage. Um, and if um, the committee would wish, we could supply you with some information about the training and public awareness initiatives that have already taken place in relation to adult safeguarding, um, if, you, if you would find that well, I think it might be better just for the purposes of today to reflect with the, the Social Workers Association as opposed to the committee. They, they, they made the, the comments. So I have Kira next. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm just looking through this document, and, and you know, correct me if I'm in the wrong thing. That the mental capacity legislation will not be passed within the current mandate of the Assembly. Is that no, I mean? that's not correct. Our ambition is to yeah, um, bring forward the mental capacity legislation within the current mandate. Um, if you remember. Um, uh, the last time we were here, we discussed this, and I was taken to task for the fact that the actual chronological date had slipped, but I said that the commitment was to do it within the mandate of the Assembly, well, and that still is our plan. I apologise if there's... Uh, I've just picked uh, it up this minute while I was... Listening well, I apologise if there's... Thanks, just, Karen, for, for clarification. That might be the risk register. All right. that, that you're oh, yes, it is. That, yeah. Yes, that so would be that a would risk, be risk that we would yeah. identify right, okay. that it yeah. wouldn't no, pass okay. during this okay. assembly, and we're trying to manage that risk. And currently, we are um, uh, uh, in consultation stage. I think a big milestone, which um, uh, Committee Member Wells isn't here, but I, if I recall, he challenged me to a wager um, in relation to whether or not we would get it uh, through the executive in time, but indeed we did. Yeah. Yeah, well, that clarifies that because I, I know you did make a commitment, and we all want to see that absolutely uh, before the assembly mandate runs out. Um, 
So that, that clarifies that. Now, the other one was, what evidence can you show for re- a reallocation of resources to invest in mental health funding? Uh, you'll be aware well, that, that, that the, the gap in mental health funding between here and the rest of the UK is um, quite significant, and we're trying to, 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 to shorten that gap. What, what, yeah. what, what, I, ha- I don't have the figures with me, um, but there has been a programme of investment flowing from the Bamford Review sure. um, uh, a, a number of years ago, and different investments have been made on the back of that. I'll be absolutely open. I think that the levels of investment never reached the ambitions that we had for that programme, but we could supply detailed figures for the investment since the publication of Bamford for you. Yeah, that would be very useful because, as you know, the mental health has always been the Cinderella of the health service, and we're trying to um, close that gap. And if, if there's any information that you can give us, it would be very useful. We will do so. Okay, right. Thanks, Chair. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, <coughs> looking through the, the programme for government commitments, you know, some of them are just about spending money as opposed to what the outcome is going to be of the spending money. Was that thought of right before they were committed to? I mean, spend £10 million on public health and you tick the box and you've got your commitment and spend £2.8 million this year on, on um, obesity and you've got the... It's not about having carried about uh, health improvements and, and reduce the number of people who are um, presenting with uh, uh, obesity to you know, hospitals. I certainly the, I appreciate the, 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 the essence of the question. They, they, were, they were set up that way and agreed by the executive, I guess, and we have been uh, therefore uh, monitoring against uh, the way they have been specified. I understand completely the importance of well, what, what actually did you get out of that, and, and Dr Reedy, I'm sure, could give you a flavour of, of some of the initiatives that have been put in place because of that, but in, in both the public health and in the obesity side. Okay, um, certainly looking at the obesity, uh, the the two big things in obesity are to try and increase the level of physical activity and also then to make sure that people are eating appropriate quantities of of healthy food. Um, However, we need to take a wider approach than that to to sort of look throughout life. So some of the, um, I'll just pick out a few examples here. In 2012-13, some of the um, programmes or, or the pieces of work that were taken forward by funding were uh, on breastfeeding services, public information campaign, food poverty initiatives, outdoor gyms, uh, physical activity referral programmes and some research into gestational diabetes. The following year, we, uh, the PHA was bringing in a pilot weight management programme for pregnant women who are obese, because we know that that really is a, a risk for the, the women themselves and also for the, the babies. Uh, working with other departments and active travel for schools, allotment sites. Um, this year, then, uh, further developing the active travel in schools. There's a Belfast active travel pilot food in schools, so that we're trying to encourage um, healthy diets in our young people right from an early age, increase fruit and vegetable consumption, and then improved coordination on, of the various activity referral programmes and further work on the, the breastfeeding strategy. So as you'll see, there's quite a wide range of programmes trying to address the, the entirety of the uh, factors that would affect obesity. We, we do know that um, Obesity, that's been overweight or obese. It's the seventh most significant factor in mortality, the eighth most significant factor in disease, and it can actually decrease life expectancy by up to nine years. And in addition, there's a considerable um, financial impact at a population level. Um, in 2009, uh, work was done that estimated that it was about $400 million, um, that... Uh, was lost or the cost of, of overweight and obesity to the population, 25% of that being direct health care costs and, 20, and 75% being indirect. So it's very important that we tackle that in a very broad uh, range, a broad manner. You're, you're talking about a lot of worthwhile progress, no doubt, programmes, no doubt, but um, are you getting on top of the issue in terms of obesity? Is that, is, is, are the programmes working? Well, that will obviously be reflected in whether we see that the rate of increase of levels of obesity, see if that is being, I suppose, stabilised and then ultimately decreased. 
in terms of the uh, strategy, the targets are to uh, decrease the, the rate of obesity and uh, overweight. I'm just looking for them here. Um, but obviously, program, programs like this will take some time. It's not just something that can be resolved by one year, two year, even three year funding. There is a major uh, change at so many different levels, and it is being um, closely monitored. Uh, um, BMI uh, measurement carried out in schools and so on, and um, the various programmes, there, there's always an, an evaluation element built into them to make sure that the funding that we are, are investing mm -hmm. is used in the most appropriate mm -hmm. and most um, effective and efficient way. And, and just the, uh, in terms of the, the issues that are marked as, as being amber, um, I think it was 22 and 61, why should there be any difficulties in with them? Well, um, if you'd got the papers a week later, the 22 wouldn't be. Amber, um, I'm very pleased to say that yesterday the uh, Minister uh, made a statement to the Assembly on making life better, which is a new public health framework, and that was the <coughs> one aspect of 22 that was outstanding. Um, the three milestones were, for 12-13, there was the new policy direction, so that's making life better. You will remember that the uh, publication of that was delayed to take into account the work that the committee had done on health inequalities and other evidence which had come forward in the meantime. So now that that has now come through the process and been launched and is now on the, the departmental website, so that is uh, that milestone has now been achieved, along with the bowel cancer screening one and the additional ten million in public health spending, which we mentioned at the start of the, the session here. And, and the milestone three for a program of government commitment sixty one in terms of. Uh, uh, developing an updated interdepartmental child safeguarding policy framework. Is it a number? Is it it is currently a number. I mean, th there are different reasons <laughs> for um, uh, the uh, delay on um, 61. I mean, we've had some issues where key staff have moved on, and you obviously have a period of time where you're waiting for a new member of staff to get up to speed. We've also had some issues in relation to some new initiatives, uh, particularly in relation to sexual and domestic violence, where negotiations with stakeholders about the shape of a new initiative, and I'm thinking particularly about the uh, independent domestic vi uh, violence advisors and independent uh, sexual violence advisors, um, stakeholders have been engaging with us about what the job description should look like and how they should be deployed, and that's turned out to be a more complex process than we had envisaged. Um, and then we've also had some additional work um, that we hadn't planned, but it's been very important work. Uh, indeed, the Chair's question referenced some of it earlier. We've been engaging significantly with the Commissioner for Older People uh, in relation to her report today, um, recognising that that work would be of value to us when we publish our, our policy. And we've also uh, had some additional work, and again, relevant work, but it was additional, working with um, uh, Lord Morris' private members' bill on trafficking um, and making sure that we were taking into account those developments in the development of policy. I hope you'll be able to achieve your, your, your milestone there. We're green amber. Children Absol in our community. Uh, uh, well, children and adults. Right. Um, uh, uh, and it's green amber, which, which means we do anticipate being able to get back on schedule. Finally, if I may, Madam Chair, um, equipment number 80, uh, milestone two for last year, was that the, the number of excess dead days would be reduced by 10 per cent compared to 11 12. What percentage did you actually achieve? Um, the, that, that was, we, we said the percentage would be um, at least 10 per cent. We exceeded the, the percentage. The, the 10 per cent against the 2011 12 baseline was rounded by 20,000, just over um, 20,000 um, excess bed days. The latest figures for March 14 were just over 19,000, so it's below the, the required level, so it's exceeded the target. And it has been lower than that throughout the period. So there, there are peaks and troughs, but 
Um, I'm sorry, I'm saying for March 14. Those figures were for December um, 13 because there is there's a time lag in terms of the coding and the measurement of the figures around this. So we don't we don't have the figures right up to um, March 14. But on the basis of the information we have, the, the the target has been met and exceeded throughout the period. And our expectation is when we get the figures for March 14, um, that will show the target has been exceeded. And those are those are monthly figures. That, so we measure it on a month on month basis. So 20,000 is a figure per month, and the 19,000 yeah. is the actual against that month. Okay. And, and, and I hope that, that uh, the outcome figure is just what happens as a result of a lot of activity. Absolutely. And that. Patients are not being moved at the short, at the last minute, in order to achieve mm -hmm. that goal. So, how do you ensure that patients' uh, care is not being endangered because of last-minute movements to hit some sort of goals or figures? Uh, well, well, there, there, you're, it's, it's an absolutely uh, very important point, and there would be a whole range of measures that would actually go in place to securing um, that reduction in access bed days. It's about patient flows. It's about management services in the community, and in each one of those. Um, we would be looking to services to deliver safe and effective services in accordance with the proper um, standards and um, uh, targets. So, throughout the whole HSC system, there will be measures of control to ensure that there, should, that there, there will not be actions taken. And, and this is a point the minister has always been very strong on: not actions taken to achieve a target. The actions are to ensure better, better care, and there are a whole range of measures. So, it's not possible to say. Here is, here is one set that actually addresses that particular commitment and that particular milestone. It's made up of a whole range of things across the service. Just looking at your, your various the programme for government commitments, it's just a pity you didn't have issues such as waiting times at A&E. Four hours well, and, and elective care waiting times, something that's really, really important. But well, actually, um, in, in constructing the, the commitments and the milestones, this is something that we do look at to try and um, identify something that's meaningful in that whole context. Oh, and and you will be aware um, that in the commissioning plan direction, that those are key targets every year um, uh, for the minister, the uh, emergency departments, the waiting times. Within the delivery plans for this, um, one of the indicators um, in terms of the effectiveness of delivery in this is actually um, ED waiting time. So it is an indicator that we look at as one of those measures that we would ensure delivery of this. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you Chair. Just briefly, um, well, I touched on what I wanted to ask anyway about Commitment 61, and in particular um, the domestic and uh, sexual violence. Issues and um, welcome the fact that the the, um, the joint domestic and sexual violence strategy has been issued for consultation and, and, and will be um, hopefully published and launched later in 14. That's great. And of course, we know with the SARC up and running, and that's really um, really good news. And I was wanting to ask as well, you know, on the fact that it's green amber broadly on track, um, is. Any delay there? I'm, I'm hoping the delay is because they work with maybe some of the voluntary agencies, and that is is going to make <coughs> sure that um, what's been done with the department has been done right, as opposed to just being done to tick a box. And uh, especially in relation to the uh, ISVAs and IVAs, and making sure that those rules are properly defined and and. A absolutely. I mean, we had 68 responses to the consultation, and 13 of those were um, from key partner organisations who asked for further time to respond. So that added some some time frame. And then, even when they did respond, um, because uh, they had so much to say, some of them hadn't followed the consultation format. And but we wanted to make sure we captured the the, 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 the things they were saying to us. So that a added some delay, and it was specifically or a, lot, a significant portion of it. <coughs> was specifically in relation to the advisers, both the uh, sexual violence and the domestic violence advisers, and the role of them and making sure they neither duplicated existing roles, um, but also added value and filled gaps where, where provisioned and currently exist. Okay, that's great. And can I just say that um, I'm very glad that it is in uh, the DFG commitments. I think it's of vital importance, so it's a, it's a good issue. Thank you. Um, just, just picked up there. You were talking in terms of the public health, the making life better uh, announcement. They just, I suppose, for for a matter of accuracy, because I noticed um, that you said that you were reflecting 
on the committee's work around health inequalities, but in fact we submitted that report to you in January 2013. So, um, whilst we'll take credit for some things, I don't think it was necessarily um, our delay in terms of the making life better. But one of the issues there is in relation to health inequalities. Yes. And whilst I do think that the, the strategy is a step in the right direction, we are ultimately talking about a whole system approach. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do we use that whole system approach to actually target the inequalities? Well, first of all, my apologies if I created the impression that uh, the committee was at fault for, for delaying the, the strategy. That wasn't uh, my intention at all. It was certainly an important piece of work that had to be taken into consideration, along with a, a variety of others. Obviously, a strategy like this gets a, a framework gets a lot of responses, a lot of interest from a very wide range of people, just by the very nature of it. Um, you're correct in saying that, yes, it is a whole system approach, and that's very much what's, uh, what is needed. It's not just I mean, improving people's health in general and reducing inequalities in particular are certainly not just the preserve of health. So it's how we work together with all the other um, departments to actually do that and with voluntary organisations, EHA, HSC. Um, and that will be, will be what's, what's required really in taking that forward is, is how we do work, work together with with them all? Yeah, I think, sorry, because I had asked this question the other day too in, in terms of the debate, but or the ministerial statement. My question really is that the, the, the statement reflects on the fact that it's almost going to be one size fits all in relation to health inequalities, although there is a concept of proportionate uh, universalism built in. Mm-hmm. So my question is, if we know that health inequalities are so stark um, between those who have and those who have not, quite bluntly. How does a system that is going to take account of accessibility for all sections of society actually address the inequalities? Well, as, as you say, there's, there's the two approaches. There's trying to improve everyone's health, uh, that, um, the universal approach, but then also there's the people who are more disadvantaged or where inequalities are greater that need additional help to try and narrow that gap between the people who are most disadvantaged and compared to those who are least disadvantaged. Um, there, probably, there isn't a one-size-fits-all, and it's trying to then go down <coughs> to a lot of work required at local level to communities who will know what is required for their particular locality. And that's where work between... Um, the PHA, the board, local government particularly with the changes that are occurring there and the need for community planning so that the approach is not just a blanket approach but so that it's tailored very specifically to the needs of local communities because obviously we've got to again try and make sure that the resources are used in the most effective and most efficient way to have the biggest impact. And I think that that's where local communities, working with them, knowing what the particular needs are of geographical communities or vulnerable groups, that work can be targeted there. So we're not starting from a blank sheet. There's a lot of excellent work going on at the minute um, and has been for many years, uh, following on from the whole Investing for Health um, strategy dating back to 2002. Um, And it's trying to make sure that we build on that. It's time to, I suppose, give things a bit of a refresh, just to make sure that, that uh, setting that strategic direction, and that's, that's um, where we're, we're pleased that the, the new framework has been published now in trying to, to do that and to refocus efforts and uh, make sure that, that we're able to move this forward. Again. Okay, well, I mean, I would, I would suggest that what we do, you know, the, the health inequalities, I don't think that we necessarily need. Uh, much more work, um, whether that be with local authorities or trusts or anybody else. We know uh, where they exist. We actually know locations. We know geographical areas. And and we're very clear that in order to redress those patterns um, and change the outcomes, we need to be doing something very different, which is ultimately about targeting and monitoring and evaluating. Um, So I would suggest to you that that process around the whole systems approach versus targeting that that you maybe come back to us in writing on how that actually will be uh, pursued. Because I think the risk in all of this 
is that if it is one size fits all, or we take that approach that it's one size fits all, that we miss um, some of the, the harsh realities in terms of health inequalities. Mm. I wonder, Chair Greg, you just maybe pick up yes. and just add to that in terms of um, when the minister set out the priorities for the HSC and set out the um, commissioning plan direction. And while the commissioning plan direction is scheduled to that is the targets and the very specific targets. The commissioning plan direction sets out the minister's direction to the health and social care um, commissioners, white services to be commissioned, taking account of the strategic issues and, st um, and strategies for the department, which would include um, uh, this strategy. So it's, it's encompassed within that planning work for the commissioners and would be reflected in the commissioning plan direction. So that's one key um, area in terms of where the minister would um, communicate that requirement. But specifically, I suppose, in terms of just moving this on, because I don't want to get into the, the minute detail of it, but I do think it's hugely important. What I'm saying is that in relation to the Making Life Better strategy, as it moves on, if we could get co correspondence from you as to the issue about accessibility to public health generally, and then within that, how that will be targeted, so that we can start, start to get a sense of of how that target will eradicate. So if we could get that and continue that, that communication, that would be useful. Finally, the, the point that I just wanted to raise was in relation to the um, 79, um, Programme for Government Commitment 79, was the imp improve patient and client outcomes and access to new treatments and services. It's green, it's fully on track for delivery. It's about enhancing access to life enhancing drugs for conditions such as cancer. There's a list, but it's cancer. So I'm just mindful of the very public debate at the moment yes. and the inequality that exists there. So how can we be green and fully on track? Um, well, well, certainly we are in terms of um, what was required um, under that specific milestone. Um, and just in terms of, I mean, the, 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 the milestone there, I mean, for 13-14, uh, was it specifically in relation to the rolling out of the Family Nurse Partnership? Um, there are a whole combination of things right across the, the three milestones for that um, commitment. But in terms of um, the, the specific issue of cancer drugs, um, uh, both the Health and um, uh, Social Care Board and the Commissioning Bodies in England they're guided by the NICE guidance and um, it, 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 in terms of the drugs that are available. And in um, uh, Northern Ireland, in relation to drugs that are available under the Cancer Fund in England, um, in Northern Ireland, um, those that are approved um, by NICE are available either on a recurrent funding basis or on a, a cost per case basis. Um, and in addition to that, for um, some drugs which are not approved, but which are um, high, high cost, um, there is the process of the individual funding requirement where a clinician can put forward to the Health and Social Care Board a request for specific funding for that drug for an individual. Um, but in terms, uh, so, so in terms of the drugs that are available and the accessibility in Northern Ireland, there, there is not a significant difference between um, here and England. But what the Minister has asked is that we carry out an evaluation of the, in, the um, individual funding requirement process and look at that and how that compares against other areas. Right, but uh, no, but just to be clear, we are saying that milestone one over 12, 13, which was enhanced access to life enhancing drugs mm -hmm. for conditions such as cancer, yes. is green, is fully on track. <coughs> well, 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 but for it's not. For, for that period, in terms of enhancing the um, uh, access to drugs, for example, the expenditure went up um, uh, from 61 million in 10-11 to uh, 90 million in 2013. Within that, the expenditure on cancer drugs went from uh, 21 million to 20, um, uh, 20 almost just over 26.5 million, so that was an increase uh, of just over 5.4 um, million. Um, sorry, that, 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 that is the expenditure um, by 13-14. So there, there has been um, increased expenditure in line with what the commitment required. Well, the, there's increased expenditure, but there still is a very clear inequality in terms of accessibility. So what I'm trying to reflect on 
is the accuracy of saying this is fully on track. If we know that there are 38 cancer drugs that are available in England, Scotland and Wales that you cannot access here, so how can we say that we are on target? Um, in terms of the 38 cancer drugs, um, uh, it's, if, if, I, if I can just quote from my briefing on this, I'm sure um, it has been widely reported in the media that there are currently 38 cancer drugs available um, in the Cancer Drugs Fund in England, um, but which patients in Northern Ireland cannot um, uh, access. Um, uh, the position is that all licensed drugs for treatment of cancer can be made available to patients in Northern Ireland, either as drugs that are routinely commissioned, the, that was the recurrent um, funding that I was talking about, or drugs that are provided on a one-off basis, on the basis of a patient's clinical exception. But I, I think you know, that's, that, that's an issue in all of this as well, the exceptionality clause, which increasingly is, is a barrier to you know, not only the person themselves accessing and, and proving that their cancer <laughs> is biologically exceptional. Uh, but also their GPs, who quite often don't apply to the system, are understanding that very clearly. So there, there's an issue about the, the exceptionality clause and the hurdle, and in my view, it should be removed. But I still go back to the point of we are seeing progress on delivery, and we are being told that something is green and fully on track, and yet we know the situation whereby the, the accessibility issue isn't on track. Well, in, in, in terms of how that milestone is articulated. The, the, the milestone has been delivered, in it, and perhaps that milestone is not articulated in terms of the specific issue that you are highlighting, Chair. But um, in terms of the evaluation that the Minister has asked to be carried out of the IFR process, that will look at how the process and the accessibility and the numbers um, in Northern Ireland, um, how effectively that works, and looking at um, the, the good practice in other areas. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, but I, I mean, I do. Yeah, I take issue. I take issue with the fact that that's green. And you know, I, I, I hear you talking about enhancing access, and and maybe there's been more spend. But is that more spend on the same issues, same programs, same treatments? No, no, that, 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 that wouldn't necessarily be because um, it would take account of, um, for example, where there was specific spend on um, uh, drugs under the IFR process. Um, I'm just trying to pick up, I do have details of um, the expenditure on the specific drugs. Um, you, did, you detailed earlier the expenditure on that, and you detailed an increase in expenditure, but I'm saying is that just more of the same? No, no um, it, it wouldn't be more of the same. Um, and and, it, and it, this, this uh, milestone does not relate to cancer drugs alone. No. Cancer drugs are one element of it, um, but um, there, it, it relates to um, anti-TNFs, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and anti-TNFs for psoriasis and Crohn's, drugs for multiple cirrhosis, um, wet AMD, Retinal fame, occlusion, and diabetic uh, macular edema. So, there, you know, it, it is about enhancing, enhancing access to drugs across a range of areas to en enhance um, quality of life and outcomes, but not not explicitly or, or exclusively cancer. Although cancer is no, I accept that. I can see that in front of me. I accept that it's bigger than that. But I, I still take issue with this being as fully on track. Roy, I think on this Just, point. Um, very briefly. In, in justifying the green, you've simply used the budget that's gone up from about 20 million to 26 million. In order to enhance, that, enhance access, uh, not only uh, it, it's that you need an, an increased likelihood of being awarded the drugs. Has there been, for instance, a, a significant increase of patients presenting? So, although your budget has increased by five or six million, that doesn't necessarily justify you saying that there is increased access. So how, how can you reassure us that there has been increased access? Um, maybe if I can um, comment on that. Um, access is, of, is about waiting times, I guess, to yeah. get access to drugs as well. Um, and we know that the waiting times have been reducing um, for those range of drugs. My question is, are more patients presenting for uh, that increased number of drugs? So is there increased access or not? 
I don't know from what you presented to me, Austin. No, I understand. I, I think there is probably more detailed information that we could provide to the committee to actually detail the numbers who have accessed um, the drugs and, and were there, and exactly how we have measured that against the milestone in terms of how it was um, crafted. There are new drugs coming on every single year, and whenever we are talking um, to the committee about the financial position, one of the pressures that we do have is around, around the additional drugs that do come online through the NICE processes. So there are definitely additional drugs that are coming online where people and patients are getting access to those on an ongoing basis. We also know that the waiting times for drugs are reducing as well, so there is a lot of work that has gone into that. And that um, significant increase in spend levels um, over that relatively short period of time um, but it's continually moving. There's always going to be new drugs coming online on stream, um, and the IFR process is part of, of access to those when they are in that unapproved position, uh, as opposed to those that are coming through the nice processes. Um, but there's a lot of focus given to ensuring that people get um, get those nice approved drugs um, as they need them, and that is having a significant impact on spend levels going through the system. The final point: the impression I, that I have. To taken from clinicians is that IFR is not giving access, it's limiting access. Too many. You know, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, and I say, we, you know, we, the Minister has asked that we carry out an evaluation, but certainly the indications are, um, we, the indications we have are that in terms of IFRs that are referred, about 98 per cent of those are approved. But, but these so did are you accept that many clinicians have stopped using it because they know they are going to get turned down because it is not exceptional? We, we, I say we, we will carry out the evaluation that, that the, the Minister has asked, but I understand the points you are making. Okay, finally, just on a similar issue, just clarification on this, maybe, if you would. Um, the much debate currently uh, around the pharmaceutical price regulation scheme. Has there been money that has come back into the system here? Um, in terms of, of what that means, it's, it means that the level of increase within the pharmacy budget is less than it would otherwise have been, um, and the, anticipate, the, the level of that, if you like, um, if I think in 13-14 was 2.8 million. Um, now that is less of growth, effectively, so the, the growth would have been at a higher level. Uh, by that tune of that 2.8 million, so you, you, um, the pharmacy budget effectively has grown by less than would otherwise have been the case. I guess is the best way to describe that. But there was, I mean, there, again, and you can come back to us and, and writing on this. There was an indication, particularly from, indeed, the cancer research unit and the pharmaceutical association, that this, the new regulations, actually only came into place on the 1st of January of this year. So it's not previous years we're talking about that this scheme that was signed by the industry and the Department of Health in Westminster it was only from January. So my question is, since January, has there been a return? And if there has been a return, how much? And if there has been a return, has it been targeted towards the accessibility of, of treatments and drugs? You're absolutely right. There was a new scheme from the 1st yeah. of January 2014, and what it has done is limited the increase in the pharmacy budget. The pharmacy budget increases on an ongoing basis, um, um, both in terms of, of drugs being coming available and also in terms of, of price inflation and, and what have you. What that scheme does is reduce that level of increase. So whenever we are talking uh, to the committee about the overall financial position, um, that pharmacy budget and the pressure within it has been moderated or reduced by the PPRS scheme um, as it's come into play. So it, it impacts on the level of growth within the pharmacy budget and means it is at, at a lower level of growth than would others have been the case, but it's still increasing um, as we look ahead. So why do organisations say there's a return into the system? Because it's a, it's a lower level of, of growth. Okay, so there, there, how, much, how much of a, a difference are you talking about? Well, my understanding is, we need to clarify the number, was it's a 2.8 million from the old scheme in 13-14. Uh, I'm not sure of the numbers as we look into 14-15. I we need to come back to the committee on that. Well, can you come back to the committee on that? And you see that the, the, the 2.8 million 13-14, was that just directed across the system? or? No, it, it impacts on the pharmacy, within the pharmacy budget. So the pharmacy budget would be, um, or spend level, was less than it would otherwise have been. Um, but there's still a pressure within that overall budget, so it means that the, the level of increase in that budget is less than it would otherwise be. 
and that impacts on the overall financial position as we as you look at it. Well, can you clarify then for us that now you will come back to this, you know, as soon as possible, in terms of the new contract that was signed from January and the implications of that? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a number of issues there we raised that we would like Boris Walton's back on, um, and we'll just look forward to your responses. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, item 10 is any other business. And date and time of next meeting is the 2nd of July 2014, starting at 3 p.m. in the Senate Chamber. Thank you.